we're, we're doing a journal club on this paper. Sorry, we're just kind of jumping into this. Um, the journal club on this paper that came out in November, though it was kind of um, different versions of it have sort of been out there for the past uh, a couple of years. Uh, but the, but it all kind of culminated in this paper, the Tolman Eichenbaum machine. And uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm leading, kind of leading a journal club here, um, presenting some slides, extracting some ideas from it that are particularly interesting to us, um, and then just kind of opening it for discussion. Uh, so the, the agenda here is first, I'm just going to draw connections to um, how I would describe this paper to anyone here, because we can describe this paper very succinctly by how it relates to the paper we did that uh, we released in 2019. Uh, and then I'm going to bring up three highlights from the paper. The first one is the, the thing that paper just like hammers on repeatedly, the main point of the paper. So of course, I should talk about this. Uh, the second two are going to be things that are more subtle, but quite interesting. Um, it, one being how the grid cell and play cell interaction happens, and the fact that grid cell that the play cells aren't reading out a multi-module grid cell code. They're not. You don't have play cells reading out from multiple grid cell modules. They found a way to do this where it didn't require that. So that that's it's quite interesting and worth going into. And the second is that both of our models have these conjunctive feature location pairs or sensory location pairs. But they do it differently in a way that's that's interesting and also worth talking about. Um, so uh, to start off with, um, this is literally roughly what I said to the team about this paper, uh, 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 how we describe it. Um, we can describe this paper quite succinctly based on uh, like our past experience. I would say it's essentially the model from our locations in the neocortex paper, uh, but where the grid cells are trained and where the grid cells can learn arbitrary transition graphs like family trees, not 2D or 3D space, not just through 2D or 3D space. Uh, and so, so this, is, this is a pretty complete summary of this paper. It gets to the fundamental, what it's, what it's, what it's pitching. Uh, and, and I'll show, uh, so, so first thing I'll say is, um, but I, I say all that, but they definitely solved a, um, a harder problem. Training the grid cells is hard. We kind of hard coded our grid cells. Uh, so in, in a sense, we kind of knew ours was going to work before we even simulated it. it we, cause it was, it was sufficiently simple that we could run it in our heads and say, yes, that'll work. And the simulations were just kind of a proof of concept or making sure we weren't fooling ourselves. Whereas this paper that trains the grid cells, uh, I would say there's no way they knew it would work. They explored the wilderness. They, they, they went deep into trying to get this to work. There's no way they just knew. So, so it was, it was a di more difficult simulation task than ours for sure. Uh, one way ours was slightly harder was um, we focus on learning multiple environments and, for, and inferring which environment the agent is in, uh, whereas they focus on quickly learning and predicting within a single environment. Uh, so this, they're both performing a sort of sensory motor prediction and sensory motor inference, but theirs is really single environment. They didn't really focus on um, distinguishing different environments from each other. Theirs was more about put the animal in an environment and see how long it takes until it can start predicting. Um, both papers, we one one thing we both drive home with like figures and stuff is grid cells uh, enable a certain type of generalization. You could call it sensory motor prediction. And, uh, and uh, before I say that, uh, so the general idea that um, given a sequence of inputs and movements, you can predict the next input. Uh, that solving that general problem, we we both we both talk about that a lot. Uh, we carried it forward to learning arbitrary objects and saying that this could happen in other parts of cortex. They carried it forward to generalizing it to arbitrary transition graphs. So rather than always navigating two D space or three D space, they might navigate a family tree, general like I don't know arbitrary relation graphs. You could come up with ways where like. I don't know, a highly advanced version of this might be, you know, sense of humor, maybe, maybe sense of humor is somehow one of these complicated graphs, like you, they, they, they trying to aim for, um, for other types of structures that can now be navigated, not just space. It's interesting, in, so, uh, uh, if I can just jump in, the, yeah. uh, in the book, A Thousand Brains, um, that I talked about this, I mean, it wasn't in the paper we wrote, but I talk about the idea that you know the dimensionality of space and the movements through the space um, could be anything, and um, and that 
and that when you're thinking about like the somatosensory cortex or visual cortex, it's easy to think about as 3D, but in other cortical areas, you, you don't want to make that assumption. And so when you're doing conceptual spaces, um, it could be arbitrary transition graphs and arbitrary dimensionals, you know, it's really has to be learned. Um, uh, so, it, but it wasn't in our paper, but it, it did sneak into, into the book. I agree with them. I think that's what yeah. got to happen. So just showing the um, iconography or visual language of the two, both of us, these tasks, the left paper TEM stands for Tolman Eichenbaum machine, this paper, and the right is our, our, is our paper from a couple of years ago. Uh, so we both use this kind of iconography of arrows and simple, uh, like symbolic uh, features that where these are just, there's not an actual motorcycle there. It's just standing for a feature. We use squares and circles and stuff to show the same concept. Uh, so, so the general um, task type is receiving a sequ sequence of actions and sensory inputs so that you can predict subsequent input. And ours had the extra, uh, the extra piece of, um, of distinguishing which object you're in, which lets you um, predict based on memory, but, but taking novel sequences you've never seen before and, and predict what you sense. So, so um, it, it's the kind of this is the kind of thing where if you've seen one of these papers, it can help you understand the other paper. And I'm, so I'm just drawing these distinctions. This type of iconography. I'll show one more correspondence. Um, their model is on the left. Our model on the right. Uh, I'll talk about ours first. We have, we talk about these two cell populations, roughly good cells and place cells, that receive a motor input. Then they uh, you know, then they predict a sensory input. Sensory input arrives. Uh, and then they they update the the location based on what happened. I can draw these same numbers on the bear network where one, two, three, and four those that same general sequence of things happens. So it's, it's really the same type of model. But once again, where their grid cells are trained, we kind of hard coded this set of this set of grid cells. Uh, so differences in mechanism, and I'm going to talk about this in a couple of slides. Is in our model, even though we didn't fully like this, we settled with a we had our place cells or quote unquote place cells the layer four cells read out from multiple grid cell modules um, and their their model finds a way to avoid this which is nice uh, the the second piece is um, we used a two, we use two different mechanisms for representing and learning feature location pairs ours used temporal I'll, I'll talk about this later, later ours used a temporal memory thing uh, theirs uses a more deterministic mapping that's interesting and this is the final thing I'll talk about in this presentation um, and, and now another thing I will compliment this paper on a lot is uh, is when it comes to models that train grid cells, um, this is, it, when I say grid cells, I mean the idealized path integrating ones with multiple multiple modules. Uh, they, theirs are very good. Uh, and importantly, each trained module has a complete set of grid cell phases. This is a sentence that is not generally true of papers that have trained grid cells, uh, at, at least from what I've seen. Uh, and this is the significant thing. In some sense, the important thing about grid cells isn't their multiple fields. It's this. It's the fact that they come in a set of grid cell and a set of phases, the translations of the same grid. And this this paper did this. So um, I, they, they like nailed this part. I, I, it's going to influence probably the way. I model things in the future, or it'll, 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 yeah, it'll, bear, it'll definitely put some influence on that. You're going to talk more about that, Marcus. Uh, exactly how they did that. A little bit. Um, it's it's it involves you know training and network. Here, I'll just say it right here. It involves having the system move around um, and try to predict its input. And they use back propagation to train a set of weights uh, or train a network. It, like high level picture, that is what they do. Getting more into the, the details of how they do it is um, more time consuming. Well, maybe I can ask you this. Um, uh, you know, the, the getting the different phases of the grid cells in a module is tricky. And we've read several papers about, you know, how parts of how that might come about. Um, and I was been thinking about that myself recently, and I talked a little bit about that last week, or maybe on you know, Monday. You know, the, the different ways that grid cells could could work from one D modules. Um, and but I think when I got, I didn't read the the this uh, new paper that you're reviewing now carefully. Um, 
But when I got to the part about back propagation, I said to myself, oh, I don't know if that's gonna even be realistic in this case. Um, and the question I guess for you is, do you think the method they're using there is actually something that's biologically uh, uh, interesting and plausible that uh, I should get into and understand it more depth in more depth. Um, I think it can be bridged so, to something that's biologically plausible. I, I'm going to click once to just show you the next bullet point um, from the discussion. It's not a biophysically oh. realistic model. Uh, <laughs> okay. And uh, so, so yeah. they're they're forward about this fact. Um, I probably read that and then I said to myself, oh, then it's, it's, it may be, I mean, you're giving him credit for doing it, but I never get too excited about things that aren't, you know, that are sort of made to work, but I don't think it's happening in biology. So I guess that's the key, the key question for me here is, is like, hey, can I learn how, what can I learn from this model about how biology actually does this? Um, um, and, and can I? That's the question. Maybe you can help me. I, that I, I'd say that this model has a complicated relationship with biological plausibility, uh, because in some cases they really put in a lot of constraints. In other cases, uh, they don't so much. They really, the, the constraints they impose are like, what are place cells going to represent? What are these so-called grid cells going to represent? Uh, and then, then they allow that to be sort of a neural network that's using back propagation. So. Mm. Um, so they they do put in constraints, but it, uh, not at the level that you usually like. Well, the then then I then personally then I find that less exciting. Then it's like okay, yeah. I mean, there's often engineering ways you can get this stuff to happen, but um, but we need a biology. We need to have biology does this. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. So what one one example where I would say they would probably give the same example that's not biophysical. Um, so to update the grid cells, first of all, this part's not surprising. To update the grid cells, they apply a set of weights to the grid cells. Um, but the way they decide what weights to apply is they take the motor command of what movement is occurring, pass it through a small deep network, um, and that network outputs a set of weights, which are then applied to the grid cells. Uh, and I, that, that would make this mechanism would make a certain type of neuroscientist cringe. Like it's it's not something yeah. that you can you can picture. Yeah. Um, yeah. And now I, I say all that I can I can always swing back and say that like I look at this and I'm like, okay, I think I could come up with a circuit that does that using simple neurons. But but it, it's I would say that they this model has multiple stop gaps where it's like uh as it's, it's it's the current implementation, they can go in the future and and substitute something that is no longer. Uh, no longer makes some people cringe, but, but well, that I mean, is the same way. Of in the same way, we could go in the future and substitute a mechanism that takes out our hardwired assumptions. So, um, uh, you know, so the question is, uh, can we learn from the mechanism that they propose? You said you you're going. It's going to influence the way you're thinking about it. Um, so that means you must think something it's biologically um, relevant or not. Um, but anyway. Okay, I just I just want to get a sense for it because because when I, I now it's coming back to me. I read this paper what a week or so ago and read a whole bunch of papers since, and um, uh, and I did recall like thinking oh, I'm not going to learn anything from that mechanism. <laughs> so maybe that's why you 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 stated it nicely, perhaps. Regardless, there will be a couple things from this paper you'll find interesting. I think. Oh, that's good. Okay, I'm just trying to it, make sure I understand which those are. So 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 hey, the Marcus, way they train uh, grid cells might be a little bit. The way they train good cells might be a little bit less uh, in your line of interest, but the two other things I'm going to point out. Okay. Are. Yeah. Hey, hey, Marcus, quick question: yeah. Are you saying here that the weights are dynamically determined for every motor command, or is it, are the weights trained by passing it, uh, doing a projection of motor commands through a deep network? The the weights are dynamically chosen by a motor command. So if you've so one okay, way to so think of this is if you've if you move um, if you have a north motor command and an east motor command but you've never moved you've never seen a northeast mo motor command um, this network might output a novel set of weights for moving northeast if if you ever do move northeast if that makes sense. Okay, I'm having trouble understanding how, okay, I guess I need to read the paper to figure out what that means. Is, is that why I, go on. Sorry. I was gonna say, I seem to remember, for example, with the motor actions that um, 
the kind of grandparent relation was um, its own unique action as opposed to being two parents composed uh, with one another. Um, but, uh, but I guess maybe that then makes more sense than if, um, yeah. Because I, I think that was something that I didn't quite get what you've written here uh, when, I, when I read it. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, have, so I, I looked at their source code. Like I, I looked at how a lot of this works to, to fill in the blanks. It was hard to get it from the paper. Not to say that that was, I don't know, it's, it's hard to communicate a model and papers in general. So for me, I, I had to look at the code. And like, the, so, so in order to understand that this is what they were doing, I had to look at the code. Okay, so this is the end of this part. Uh, I'm moving on to now talking about the three highlights from the paper. Um, so the, the first one is something we briefly touched on just a few minutes ago. Uh, the, the, the big idea of this paper uh, is something they've talked about before. Um, and a couple of years ago, this paper came out uh, and I reviewed it here. This was back before we were recording these and I praised it a lot. Like I, it was, it was thought provoking to me. And, um, and the, the general idea there is that, um, that medial entorhinal cortex, among other areas, uh, learns about abstract structure that occurs in multiple contexts. Um, and when I say abstract structure here, for example, 2D space is a form of abstract structure. It's not a thing you could counter directly. It's a thing that uh, is, a, is a type of structure that encounter, that occurs in multiple contexts. Um, and so one thing that, um, one way this influenced me is it made me wonder, is it correct to think of an orinal cortex as a space processor or is it, a something else, uh, is space a special case of what entorhinal cortex can represent? And when I say space, I'm talking about things that have like path integration properties, right? something that can be called Euclidean. And I would say it, it, like, I'm, this is my only one, this is my only slide on this topic, even though it's like the core um, idea of the paper. Uh, but so I felt the need to get it across. Uh, it's an interesting idea to me that uh, is, you, I, I get it, but then you said something which confused me, Mark, because you said yeah. that um, that in general, you wouldn't necessarily have, have to have path integration. Um, I think you just said that. And, and I'm surprised by that because I felt like there can be all kinds of abstract spaces, but, but to me, path integration is one of, is sort of the, uh, the essential goal of a representation of space. And I so I, 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 sh I should have said it's not Euclidean. Uh, okay, well, that's that's different. Like like right. navigating a family tree has a form of path integration. Yeah, uh, exactly. sure. Yeah, yeah. Then, so yeah. path. I mean, the, the path. Just to be clear, path integration is the the key to planning or prediction or uh, you know uh, generating novel motor, motor behaviors. It's it's you know if you can't do path integration, what's the point of having organized knowledge, right? It, it, there's no point in it. <laughs> um, otherwise, you're just sort of you can't you can't figure out how to get someplace. Um, so, so I think, I think that's a requirement for any system, unless I'm misunderstanding something. It doesn't have yeah, to be, it doesn't have to be Euclidean, right? Yeah. I mean, I've talked about too, like the different, uh, the move, the one D moving vectors I've talked about don't have to be linear. They can be weird stuff, you know, it's just, it's just some behavior that you can integrate over uh, path integrate over some, some behavior. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. This paper uses a um, an, an example of a totally different type of task, not not two D navigation, not navigating a family tree. They talk about Harlow's task, which is, I mean, here I'm talking about a different paper, but they talk about the task of um, of you, you know a, a monkey. You put two objects in front of it. Um, if it picks one up, it gets a reward. If it picks up the other, it doesn't. Um, and and repeatedly, if it just keeps picking up the correct object, it's going to keep getting the reward. Uh, and um, soon, monkeys learn the, this rule. And and um, after through various trials, the objects get swapped out. Two totally random other objects get swapped in. A uh, different one gets is the prize object. And and what monkeys learn over time is that they learn the rules of this. That like one of these objects is the prize one. Once I find it, I should just keep grabbing it. Um, and so there's a certain structure there across the task. And um, th this paper laid out that like what grid cells are doing and 
what a network is doing that's solving that problem are one and the same. Uh, you, you give it one task, it learns grid cells. You give it another task, it learns to do Harlow's task. It learns how to, uh, the, the rules of always choose the, um, the, the one that was rewarded previously. Uh, hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to um, accurately portray their mental model here, uh, that hmm. they're coming in from a different side of things. Um, so th this is this is my only slide for this idea. The, the next two are a little more low level, but interesting to us. So um, something nice they did was they found a way to do this whole model where they don't have their place cells reading out from multiple grid cell modules. Uh, here, th their model uses five modules. Um, and I'll go ahead and bring up more labeling text. The, the top part um, is an auto associative network or an attractor network. Uh, that stores location sensory pairs or feature location pairs. Uh, so, so there are cross connections at the place cells, but the but not these connections. This these modules, the grid cell modules and medial entorhinal cortex, um, are only projecting to and from this these place cells. And one more label is um, across the modules, the spatial scale increases. Of course, they they let the network decide what to do, and the network sort of naturally chooses to use different spatial scales. They have to nudge it a little bit. Lateral, lateral entorhinal cortex, which provides the sensory input, uh, has a temporal scale increase. And what I mean by that is they really do a sort of smoothing or a filtering. Uh, in, in, our, in some of our older language, we would have called it union pooling. Uh, but it's, it's the idea of you know, smoothing inputs over time and, and where this module is actually receiving sort of a time average of the current input and previous inputs, whereas this module is receiving only the instantaneous input. Um, and then hmm. the, the, the next slide is going to, the, the third highlight is going to dive a little deeper into how they pull this off. Um, how so, they, so it's, I want to make sure I understand what you just said now. Maybe I'm confused. There's two ways. I, I can look at this diagram and I can say, oh, these are like columns in the cortex. And I can say like adjacent columns in the cortex. Or I could say these are like columns in the cortex, but they're hierarchically arranged columns in the cortex. Um, is either one of those correct? They use the word hierarchical when they talk about these. Because so, when you talk about, if yes. you're talking about change in scale going from left to right here, that would be more of a hierarchical um, model as opposed to multiple columns at a single level voting. Now, if you look at, you look at the play cells, you know, projecting back and forth to play cells, you can easily imagine that's the voting between columns. Um, but that's not what you're saying here, I think. Maybe. Well, it, it is evocative of that. And I kind of intentionally- uh, Yeah, but, but if, the modules, if the modules are representing different scales, um, not just different uh, locations in, this, in an object space, then it would be more of a hierarchical model, like V1, V2, V4 type of thing. No, so um, in this case, the the feature location pair is represented by this whole population of place cells, uh, all of them together. But they're at uh, different scales. Yeah, but the, the, the way theirs works is uh, is that this is one big attractor network mm -hmm. where essentially anyone can connect to anyone anybody. Well, that's that that would be interesting uh, because. That is, in some sense, like voting across uh, regions or voting across yep. scale, which we haven't really dealt with at all. We've done voting within a region, you know, in which I'm sure is happening, but but we don't really have a good theory about voting between or what the we don't have a good theory about hierarchy uh, in our model. I think um, we don't we we understand it less than we used to understand. It, I think so. So if this that's very interesting about this is that if this is a, a sort of a key to saying, okay, we've done voting across columns in a single scale. This could be voting across columns in multiple scales across modules, which I think I really want to understand because we, we don't understand that right now in our model. But that's what it is. Yeah. Here it's simply you, voting I, on a feature location pair rather than voting on like object identity. It's voting on a feature location pair. Yeah, just a single feature location pair. Yeah. Um, is there, in their model, is there any, any representation of the entire object uh, like we no. do with our temple pooling layer? No, they, they have no notion of environment identity or anything like that. It's, hmm. it's a thing that they just clearly did not choose to, 
to address. Did you, did it change your opinion? I mean, that's a big part of our thinking in our model. Uh, I'm just, I want to double check. Should I be concerned about that? Is there something like, hey, maybe we got that wrong or do we got it right and they just didn't pay attention to that, this particular problem? Um, I'm, I'm under the assumption that we have a single, you know, I look at the world, I see something, I have a singular percept of it. Um, and um, it's stable through movement. And so to me, that's like saying, okay, there's a there's an object identity, which is unique and, uh, and it's unique to its pose, as we would say. And, um, and, it's, uh, and it's, it's stable during movement. Um, so there has to be this, but it's, it's not a feature. It's not just a feature pair. It's, you know, it's not, it's not just like a, a location feature pair. It's, it's the whole object. So can I, would, would it be correct to assume that that, that would, would you personally, would you feel like, hey, that's still there, they just didn't talk about it? Or do you think they somehow made it obviated the need for it? Uh, I guess two part response. Um, they chose not to address that at all. Uh, and mm. it is just not something that they focus on. How does, uh, um, how do you maintain your, um, the context that you're in your living room right now? Uh, they just don't address that. Um, as for whether I think a stable ID representation needs to be present, um, I don't know. I, I really don't know. It, if, um, if you're in a location space or in a reference frame that is specific to an environment, um, maybe that's enough. Maybe you don't need the stable ID. I don't know, is my real answer. Well, yeah, yeah again, well, okay, so, so uh, everything I've done up to now has been pretty much grounded in the belief that you do have that. It's an observation as much as anything. So, um, so you're, what you learn here doesn't shake you that. It doesn't say like, oh, they showed that's not necessary. And you know, no, it, it's not like that. Um, you're saying, hey, just didn't do it. It doesn't, that, that doesn't change how I feel about it. What this does do, though, I'm, I'm gonna let you continue on a moment because I think it's very interesting is I think what you're suggesting is um, one of the ways it got around by having a single module, uh, a grid cell module, for example, is by using this hierarchy of scale. Is that I think that's what this picture implies. Yeah. Um, which is a very interesting idea. But both the things could be happening. You know, if you think about the hierarchical projections in the cortex, they're not the same. It'd be like from layer three to layer four, going up a hierarchy. Not, not, not even going directly to the thalamus, but just like from layer four to layer three direct, on the, on the layer three to layer four direct and part of a hierarchy like V1 and V2. Um, in that case, that could be the arrows here. And that could be something that, um, this could explain that perhaps. So I think that's an interesting, an interesting idea. So I'll let you continue on. Yeah, and a quick and terminology on, uh, on, question. Yeah. yeah, quick terminology. I mean, if you have two different scales, isn't that necessarily implied two modules? I thought one of the oh, that's true. distinctions between mod. <laughs> I mean, if there, you can't have a single module at different scales, or or can you? Uh, I, I missed what you're objecting to. This is one scale. This is another scale. This is another scale. So was I saying those yeah. are different modules? That's multiple. Those modules. are different modules. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed something. Yeah, so I think Jeff said that the one of the ways they get around having different modules is by having different scales. Oh, I got it. Yeah. I think to me, it, if you have different scales, it implies different modules. But yeah. It, yeah, in our work though, when we talked about having multiple modules, one of the objections I had to it was, is that um, there, there only seemed to be one module that in, in, in the enteronal cortex grid cells, MEC grid cells, there only seemed to be one module at each scale. And, and so when you mixed in our model, if you were trying to read out from multiple modules, I would always argue that a cell that's reading, getting input from multiple scales uh, would be fooled uh, because some would be stable, some would be changing those inputs. And if you may recall, I argued like, I don't think that's gonna work. Um, and so we try to find ways that we have multiple modules that differ by orientation or slight variations in scale. Slight variations of scale and, and different orientations would require to solve the multi-module um, problem. Uh, but we didn't really see that in the antibiotic cortex. We saw you know, one module at this scale, the next module 1.4 or whatever it was. And so we never really resolved that. Um, we never really got to the bottom of that problem. 
So this they may have a way of getting it to work with. Because we're not no no cell here. I as you're pointing pointing out here, if I look at all the, the blocks labeled, labeled MEC, there's no single cell that's looking at inputs from those different blocks, and which is the objection I had to having multiple scales. So this is this is using a sort of indirect method of, of doing it. Um, anyway, it's interesting. Also, one more thing about voting, a conversation we've had in the past that uh, that you've often agreed with me on, uh, or we, we've often agreed on, is that um, is that voting on object identity is um, not that powerful compared to if you could vote on, you know, an object at a pose, for example. Yeah. If you can vote on something a little more informative, it makes the system much more powerful. Uh, so it wouldn't be surprising to me that the, that the representation that goes across all of these is not just an identity. It's it's uh, maybe a, an environment at a certain pose or something. Yeah, like well, that. that's right. Although I don't, you haven't made the argument why this model does that yet. No, I, I don't think you have. No, I, I would say this model doesn't do exactly. I mean, that, I think but... I think our, we our our thinking has evolved uh, clearly. I mean, we don't even think it's features at locations anymore. We think it's displacements, right? So we haven't gotten there yet, but. But um, I think you're right. I mean, it's interesting. You can really do a lot of introspection here. You look at something, and I have the stable representation of this this um, outdoor chair I'm looking at right now, and it's it's the chair at a pose, right? I don't just see chair. I see chair at a pose. It's distance and orientation to me, and so that would be the that would be the voted item. That is what I'm consciously aware of. So I think you know, in our thinking, we've gone beyond that. Although I don't think it's but it's gonna, you know, to me in my mind now, it's it's the pose that's it's described in um, somehow it's gonna be described in displacement cells. But, but but we'll get to that. Right? Yeah. So I think we're in agreement with that. So so if this, if their model actually shows how you get to pose here, um, and that's being voted on across scale, that's a very interesting idea. Um, and I like to understand that because that solves some problems that we haven't been able to solve. I would say their model as is doesn't do that. It might be possible oh. to adopt. Oh, no, I was hoping. <laughs> OK. Too bad. Uh, so final highlight is going to dive into what interaction is occurring here. This medial entorhinal, which is the location, lateral entorhinal cortex, which is sensory information, and how the place cells are determined from that, which is analogous to, in our model, it's our location layer, layer 6, uh, which would be this. Our input, which would be kind of the thalamus, really. And and how it determines which layer four cells are active. Are you saying the LEC is really just a, a spatial, um, like a, like a layer four type of you know uh, feature? Is that what you're saying? Here? Like the like input that? to layer four, I'd say. Yeah. It's, okay. It's, uh, it, it's a, you can it's think a of it as just the sensory information. Okay. So it's, it is the it, going back to like V1, for example, or you know fission. We've been talking about separating out the the. Uh, the magnet cellular and the parvocellular uh, input stream. So the LEC would be equivalent to the parvocellular input stream. It's the it's a sort of this feature, if I'm wrong. Is that right? Yes. Yes. And the one and one bit of processing that occurs, among others, would be the temporal smoothing of it. The the fact that the higher scale modules might receive something that is a little bit more, or like I called it before, a union pooling in our previous terminology. Mm. Okay. I never heard of LEC referred to that way. I always thought that LEC. I think. In previous papers, we uh, the comparison was made between like between what and where pathways, um, as opposed to here you're saying it's like, hey, the, um, I've got a, a a spatial feature coming through LEC. I've got my my metric space from MEC, and um, and then then place cells are the union of the two or the combined combination of the two. Um, there is some people talking about it, LEC being primarily sensory. I, I just I hadn't heard that before. Yeah, I don't I don't remember us discussing that before, which is which is very interesting. I find that so then I could say then you could say the following: you could say, okay, you've got your sort of grid structure in MEC, you've got your spatial uh, pattern in LEC, and what place cells are really doing is essentially saying, okay, what feature is at what location, um, and call that a place cell. Um, and, and I would say that that's uh, so the reason this paper is called Tolman Eichenbaum machine. That's one of Eichenbaum's hypotheses, is that that's how you think of medial, medial entorhinal cortex and lateral entorhinal cortex. And I, don't, I just don't remember us discussing that before. So that's, that, that opens up a whole different set of uh, possibilities for me to think about LEC that way. In that case, LEC might be, you know, as you said, the input from the thalamus. Um, it, I'm not sure if that's really what it is or if it could be the, um, 
um, well, you know, it recently, I'm sorry to go off topic, but this, I'm just working on this all the time right now. So uh, I, we're talking about how, you know, your, your, both your motor commands and your spatial pattern on say the retina on your finger has to go through a, a reference frame transform, has to be transformed by orientation. And so I argued that was what's going on in the thalamus uh, before it's projected to layer four. So maybe LEC is providing that role here. Could that be somehow, again, we're, in the, we're not in the cortex, we're up in the you know, other part of the brain. Um, could the LEC be performing that um, reference frame transformation and, and, or do they have a specific role for it? Possibly, because like one thing you can, one thing, one type of cell you'll find in LEC is they respond if the animal is next to a, an object but they don't have to be facing the object. Uh, they they can it's they don't have to be looking at the object. So that seems a little bit like a reference frame transformation. Mm. But mm. I that's the best thing I can. It um, it's been it, it's been literally years since I've looked at that. Okay, let's let's keep going then. Okay, so yes, the the what this mechanism is. Um, so they're different feature location pair approach. Um, their hippocampus, their place cells, their place cell population has one place cell for every medial and entorhinal cortex, lateral and entorhinal cortex cell pair, which they visualize down here. Um, so the lateral and entorhinal cortex, like a temporally filtered sensory input, um, and their medial and entorhinal cortex, which is a set of grid cells, which they visualized as 1D here, but could be visualized otherwise. Um, for every pair of those cells, they have a place cell. And um, this is visually evocative of mini columns with sensory input deciding which, um, which mini columns receive input. So in the next slide, I'll show that a little more how inference occurs. But yeah, this, this, is, this is a core part of, of this. You're, you're going to need to see the next slide to really grok it, I think. So I'll, I'll move on to that, but we can come back to this. And um, so they have a, this is three modules, um, three, three modules where, and I've, I've shown this as a, uh, I've basically taken their figure here and stretched it out like this. And I've also intentionally made it resemble our models with mini columns because it at least can be visualized this way. So here I'm gonna show, um, inference occurring where they're where they're recalling a remembered feature location pair. So so what happens here is the lateral and serenal feature information um, selects a set of conjunctive cell conjunctive place conjunctive location sensory cells aka place cells and gives them excitatory input. Um, but this happens in each module and so different pairs are different pairs of so-called mini columns receive excitatory input. Um, then an attractor state is found. A, a memorized set of cells that has been active in the past before is found in this using recurrent connections, using, you can think of it as any kind of auto-associative memory, any kind of almost like a hop field network, um, where this pattern has been memorized this pattern has been learned by synapses. It's an attractor state of the network. Uh, so that if this set of columns ever becomes active, it will then, after a couple of iterations, re resolve to this. And from but that, you can read out which grid cells should be active. Go on. Wouldn't there be multiple of those attractor states? For, um, so, so if this sensory feature has been sensed in multiple places, yes, uh, which is often the case. Yeah, so then you, wouldn't, you, you couldn't settle. Right, I mean, in our model, you often can't settle until you move or you have voting. They're so, gonna have the same set of issues. Basically. Okay, so I just wanna be clear, it, it won't settle on, in the general case, it won't settle on it. Right, if, it, if, it's a, if it's an ambiguous feature, which it often is, you're gonna have multiple of these blue horizontal columns. So that's equivalent to our saying, hey, this input is in multiple locations. Uh, so we, in some sense, form a, a union of the possible locations. Yes. Yeah, that, is, all those same things will happen. That's in our paper, so yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so I guess here as well, these are scalar values. Yes. Not, uh, Though I think you're, you're totally right. 
No, I think you, it also is helpful to just think like, at least to teach this, you can think of it as binary values. And I think it can still right. work. Right, yeah, yeah, no, this, this is a, a, yeah, I really like this visualization, but yeah, I just clarify now. So yeah, you're, you're totally right though. In fact, the, the previous figure shows these all different colors yeah. because right, exactly, they're multiplying yeah. cell activations, which is weird when you think of scalar activations doing that, but uh, yes, uh, you're totally well, right. I think that I think the point you make, though, Marcus, is a really important one. In our in our mind, you you, you should be able to understand these with, with in some sense without the scalar. The, the, the scalar is really helpful, but the, there's a structural element to this that is not built purely on scalar activations. It's built on the it's an intersection of these cell populations, right? Um, so I, I think it's important. I mean, if you take a typical deep neural network, the cell you know, and you have a dense activation state. Well, that's all you have is scalar activation, right? But as soon as you start having sparse representations, then you have a population encoding. Uh, it doesn't mean you don't have scalar representations, but population coding is sort of in some sense dominant. So I think this is still a population code method here, uh, where the concept of unions would matter and things like that. And, and they do aim for sparsity because the, they they use um, they use scalar values, but then they um, then they apply a threshold where anything with scalar below one gets zeroed. Okay. So, so they want it to be sparse, basically. Okay, they that's want good. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, an interesting thing about this, I think I have one more slide. Uh, oh, just before you go, go did on. they did they deal with the issue of uh, showing um, the ambiguity where you have multiple blue cells active at once? Did they talk about that? I don't think they really focused on that. Because Reading. I mean, that was, that's really the key. If you recall in our work, that was one of the key problems we were dealing with, right? Resolving that ambiguity. And, um, and, and we got it to work, but we weren't totally happy with how we got it to work because right. you know, the, the unions can get too big and then the whole thing falls apart. Um, and so, you know, it didn't bother me too deeply because there's various ways you can imagine getting around that problem which I won't get into right now. But, um, but, but that was one of the key problems we were dealing with. It's this ambiguity. You touch something with your finger and you don't, it could be part of anything. And yet somehow through movement, you were able to resolve that. So I, I'm not, I, I'm just asking, are you saying they didn't deal with that issue? So, so what, what I'll say is they, for, for, I've read their model, I've read the code and my understanding is like in my mental model, it's going to work a whole lot like ours. What we call path integration of unions, their, their model is going to do the exact same thing. It's going to activate multiple blue cells. You move, it's going to path integrate them all. And it's going to have all the same pitfalls as ours as well. Oh, so you think in the code that they might have actually accomplished that? Yeah, I mean, the, the way these work is each grid cell is capable of activating independent of other grid cells. And so there's no reason, like some models of grid cells, these unions are implausible. The continuous attractor, it, you wouldn't be able to path integrate unions. But my understanding is that theirs is, and I'm using the word union as if everyone knows what that is, but when you have multiple multiple cells, a superposition of locations. Yeah. All right, so, so if you, and, and, and would, their, would, would their system then naturally narrow down to a single yes. unique thing? And, well, and in that case, you had mentioned earlier that they're only doing a single environment, not multiple environments. So their issues, uh, a, you know, a, so a, presumably a, their unions will be much smaller because you, know, you, you have wouldn't have as much problem, ambiguity. But you, but you won't have as much, right? Yeah, an you won't edge, have as much. An edge, could be, an edge on my finger could be part of a hundred different objects, but a, a curved edge, for example, but a curved edge on a coffee cup could only be a few places where it could be. Um, so, but we still haven't gotten to the issue yet of um, uh, the core thing we're going to talk about, which is how they get away with one module. Right? We haven't we haven't addressed that yet. Have well, we? how they uh, okay? Th this this is sort of what's what's going on here. Um, so when first of all, you're saying one module. What you what you mean is one scale has. You're saying there are a total of you know five mod modules in this, and that each individual one. Is kind of operating on its own. Yeah, but you haven't in this picture here. We're not uniting them. We're not. We have, this is just showing what one module is doing, right? Well, th this is three modules. Uh, yeah, but uh, well, oh, I see. Um, and, and, but you're not showing how they interact here yet. 
just just that there's a I could have drawn side to side arrows from these cell these two cells to these two cells to these. Two All right. Cells. So the attractor network is not just the cells in one module. Right. The attractor network goes across multiple modules. Yes. And that they justified with the with anatomical evidence. Yeah, well, I think. Uh, I mean, that's consistent with our voting neurons. We, we say the same thing. Um, but we haven't tried to figure out if that somehow obviates the needs for multiple modules at each level. Um, so the, the specific pairing is shown here in, let's say, the left module of a sensory input in a location. Well, that location, that blue, that blue triangle on the bottom left hand corner here, could represent a location in, in 100 different objects. Again, maybe they're not dealing with that different objects. Maybe that's the key here. If that location could be on hundred different objects, then you know it's just it's just it's it's not specific to a particular um, object. Then then you have this then you have this problem that has to be resolved, right? You, you then your then your input and your location are very they're not unique at all. Um, so it, so on the other hand, if they if they had one very large environment, that'd be equivalent to many objects. Uh, is it why? Why is that? Just because the key thing that matters is the number of learned locations that you, the number of locate feature location pairs you've ever learned. Well, that's assuming that that the blue grid cell, if you will, is repeating over and over again in that environment, right? Um, yes. Yes, exactly. That yeah. that that is what that assumption. I mean, I guess also they're not really trying to address, or at least not explicitly trying to address something like uh, object recognition here. It's more about learning the structure of quote unquote an object, which is here an environment. Well, so that but you can you, predict how it changes or, or kind but, of where you are on you, that. But if you're going to make a prediction, you have to have somewhere that has to be a representation, even if it's not separately represented that the, the the internal state of the system has to be unique to that object uh, yeah uh, and, and, and so i guess that's where both the resetting of the heavy and weights between uh environments and also as far as i understand it's it's different um it's completely different networks that learn the family tree structure versus the 2d graph structure for example so even though like there might be a an elegant solution at least at this point, they haven't specifically addressed kind of how how to infer, for example, what kind of structural uh, mm. situation you're in, or, or how to yeah have maybe the representational capacity to deal with um, preserving weights across environments. I have so many different thoughts on this. Um, um, yeah, definitely one of the moving pieces here is that there are some problems they chose not to solve yet. And yeah, like the things Niels just pointed out, where they actually use different sets of weights for different environments, even. Uh, and, and looking in their code, I can see that they've tried to deal with that other ways. They've tried to use like essentially masks, where you mask out certain sets of weights for different environments. When you say but, weights, I, I'm, gonna, I, I'm an interpretation of that. I don't know if it's correct, but you tell me if, I, if, if my interpretation is correct. One of the way I've thought about this is that a column in the cortex, it's got a set of many columns in it. And to, in my mind, the space, the motor, sensory motor space that's represented by that column is fixed. After, it's learned, but it doesn't change dynamically. That is, that column basically says, everything I'm going to learn is going to be built on the same sensory motor space. I can't, I can't have a hex, I can't have a, a two-dimensional, you know, um, I, or square, I, they had pictures in their paper, like, you know, the square grids and hexagonal grids and whatever. It, a single column is not going to swap back and forth between those. It's going to, it's going to learn some representational space and it's going to try to put every damn thing it learns into that representational space. Uh, and what I think you're telling me here is that they can, they can swap those out. That is, they can, they can go from a hexagonal space to a square space uh, dynamically. Is that what you're saying? I think so, yeah, but I yeah. I can't say that confidently. I don't feel I, like I'm. I, I don't okay, think well, I've internalized I, their mental model to be able to accurately. I, I, I'm almost certain that I, I I 
put good money on that, that that's not the way it is. Just one one thing, like one one piece of evidence that they might bring up is um, is also an, it's a different paper from Tank's lab than we usually bring up. It's the one with a rat um, putting its hand on a lever, uh, pulling down the lever. Here, a musical pitch plays, pitch goes up and up, and grid cells seem to represent the location in that sequence in that pitch sequence. Uh, but this same cell, well recorded, if the animal's moving around in two D, is a standard grid cell. And so it yeah, seems I, to be representing locations in two different spaces. Well, it, it, this, it, I guess I'm trying to differentiate the, the, the metric shape of a space versus what the space is being used to represent. Fair point. You know, uh, you know I could say, imagine this. I can say, I have three dimensions, x, y, and z. And I have movements. I know how to move and path integrate in those three dimensions, x, y, and z. Uh, and I'm a column, that's what I've learned. Um, I'm going to now, everything I'm going to learn has to fit within that. I mean, I can, I learn that space and it could slowly morph, but, but on a moment to moment basis, if something else come along, I have to fit it into that space. I have to fit it into a three-dimensional space and the movements I have. I, there's no, I can't change myself to represent something completely different very quickly. It would be yep. a very slow process. Um, so that's a say I found it. My, my first one. guess is, sorry, uh, my first guess is that they might, they would, say what you're saying is reasonable and they might say that um, that entorhinal cortex learns one type of space whereas prefrontal cortex might learn a totally different type of space i would totally agree with that cortex. right and v1 the space represented by v1 and v2 i mean essentially every every cortical column in my mind um has to learn its own space <laughs> and um and depending on what its inputs and its motor behaviors are primarily what its motor behaviors are <clears throat> then that determines the space. Um, and so they'd be different. Um, you know, a, a column in S1 is going to be different than a column in E1. Um, but, but yeah, okay, that's fine. But there wouldn't be, I wouldn't be swapping it out in an individual column. If I looked at the left column here, the left module here, I wouldn't be one moment, it would be one set of spaces, one space, and the next moment, a different space, uh, which sounded like what Neil was just saying. Like no, uh, I, I was more pointing out that, yeah, because they explore different uh, structures, but um, or kind of structural spaces and, and how that can be learned. But but at least at, at this point, don't talk about kind of how to uh, well, it was yeah, a, have, have a system that can handle multiple. Um, I thought you I used I thought you said the term swap out the weights, uh, swap out the weights. I thought that's what you said. But maybe. So. Uh, so yeah, no, so I, I think maybe at that point I was talking about the heavy uh, weights they use for the attractor, the short-term uh, weights. Oh, so oh, those, oh, those are reset after each oh, I see. Um, I see. after each environment or between each environment. Yeah, I mentioned the model has a couple stop gaps and I'd say that's one of them. Uh, Can I go back to the, uh, the attractor state across, I mean, the, uh, the sort of the voting across scale here? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So I could go back to this slide. Well, that or it was in that either one. Just whatever. Yeah. 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 Fine. You, you don't draw the lines here, but you could have horizontal lines going across between, yes. the, between the three modules here. Um, that would have been good. I should have drawn arrows from here to here. That's all right. Um, it, it, one of the challenges with that, and I have to think about it more, is again the issue I brought up earlier: why we didn't want to mix uh, grid cell modules of different scale, is that. Um, that the the inputs the, the state of the mod, uh, of the module on the left will be changing much more rapidly than the state of the module on the right. Um, if I at least in my thinking that's what happens at least that's what I think you know that's the way I've been thinking about this. And so it it's it's interesting. To say, what is an attractor state when some of the elements are moving and some of them are changing and some of them aren't? Um, how does that work? I mean, I can't if I if I know the the the, the state of the module on the right that would map into multiple states on the module on the left. And, and so I can't have a, you know, our voting in some sense, we always talked about it voting on a single um, cortical region. So they'll all be running at the same scale in some sense, and they all be changing at the same sort of speed or rapidity. Um, and, and so you could vote across that, but I don't know how you'd vote across um, modules that are operating at different um, time scales. Does that does that question make sense? Do you understand that? It makes a lot of sense, and I don't have a good response. It's a valid thought. It does feel a little wonky. Yeah. 
Okay. I mean, I'm, I really, I, I'm trying to make this work because I like the idea. So like, oh, that's a really brilliant idea. We could, we could, we could somehow find this voting across uh, scale, uh, across regions or across hierarchy. And I'm trying to, th I'm thinking about trying to make it work and I'm struggling a little bit. Right? So uh, um, it'd be nice if I could, we could figure out what that is. Okay, I'm not demanding. So the final slide is just pointing out uh, why I think this is an interesting feature location mechanism. Uh, and first I'll just say it, uh, given you know, a feature and a location, it is deterministic exactly which cells activate. Uh, so no, no matter what representation you put here and you put here, it's going to activate a certain site type set of place cells or layer four cells. Uh, it, in our model, that's not the case. It's not deterministic. Uh, it's a there's an element of randomness, and then we have to learn the pattern in order. Oh, you're saying you're saying that 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 is predetermined that that uh, that that set that intersection. Yeah, it's not learned. Uh, it. I either it's not learned or it's learned once in life and then never has to be again. Well, how can that be? How, uh, now I'm really confused, Marcus, because if I say, well, if I tell you what the, the cross connections are learned, but yeah, then, no, but within okay. within a particular module, I say, here's a feature, red triangles, and and there is where it's going to be. Uh, you don't have a choice. It's going to be that green triangle location. But that doesn't seem possible. I mean, it, it, it doesn't seem possible to interpret the blue the blue triangles and the blue triangle as um, as a as a specific location because because in a, in any particular environment, um, it it just I can't do that. I mean, I it's like uh, or or either that or the location is not a metric location and, and you don't do path integration. Uh, um, th this will do path integration. It's just that this. This pair of cells is a very ambiguous feature location pair. But but if I can do a unique mapping between the blue triangle on the left and the red triangles on the bottom, if that's fixed. No, 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 no. Uh, oh. th this is not fixed. I've, I'm saying, uh, OK, these two cells being active uniquely does represent these two cells being active in this being active. But you said it wasn't learned. Is it learned or not learned? It could be hardwired. It could be learned. Well, if it's hardwired, I don't see how it works. I don't see how you can do path integration if it's hardwired. If it's not hardwired, well, sure, then it's that this is just the associative linking between feature and location or, you know, observation and a metric phase. But if it's hardwired, then it can't be that. Then it's, it's, it's just, um, I can't do path integration there because because the, I can't say that the next uh, blue triangle down, if I move move north a step, then um, then it and uh, then it's going to. Um, I can't guarantee that that's going to map to the next sensory input. You follow? You can't path integrate this, but you no. can path integrate this. But I don't see how you can if the if the uh, if the small red triangles are not learned if they're just if they're if that's just a, a hard-coded intersection between blue and big red, then then I can't. It just can't work. I mean, I, it'd be like saying that that's sort of like dictating at a certain location you're going to see this feature, and the next location you're always going to see this feature, and that's just there's no start. prediction of what feature you're going to sense. It's just like if this. Is, you're saying well, this can't path integrate, but it can. Well, uh, if I path integrate and I go to the next blue triangle, yeah, then dictate what red triangle little red triangles I have. It won't and, it won't tell you anything about which red triangle. The feature information is going to change at that point. Yeah, but 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 this intersection is unique. I'm, we must not be communicating properly. If the little red triangles are not learned, if they're just like there's just a mechan mechanistic intersection here, then then they represent a spatial feature at a location, but it's not learned. If it can't be learned, then I can't use it to learn the actual structure of, of, of an object. It, it, it has to be learned. I mean, uh, their figure from the paper is this one. They're taking two vectors and multiplying them by each other. Uh, every pair of grid cells is being multiplied by every pair of 
every grid cell is being multiplied by each possible sensory cell. And that's what this representation is. It's just the product of all the possible combinations. Maybe I'm um, not following, but is it maybe the kind of um, resolution to this is the idea that the kind of substrate on which this encoding is taking place is kind of hardwired and potentially kind of determined at birth or whatever, but the encoding itself is flexible uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and can resolve. If yeah. you're saying that, that we're, we're, you're relying on the scale, if we're relying on the scale of activation of the little red triangle, maybe that's what you're saying, perhaps like, like the intersection between the two is fixed, but the scale of activation of the little red triangles is not fixed. Is that maybe what you're saying? Like, I, yeah, I guess any any given pair, their association is is fixed in this, yeah, in this um, figure. But whether, I guess, which of these are kind of actually activating to represent any given uh, association is not fixed and therefore that's where the kind of encoding power comes from the the multi-module thing is vital here like it, it this is a single module here it doesn't do much that's relying on the multi-module code of place cells rather than a multi-module code of grid cells i think maybe that's the confusing part hmm well uh, okay that pretty phrasing it that way is interesting um Phrasing it that way is interesting. You can think of it like, okay, we have a grid cell, we have a place cell module, another place cell module, another place cell module, and um, um, they're not unique, um, but the ensemble of them is unique. Yes. And in this, this, uh, and that's and that's shared both ways, and so that allows um, somehow you're saying allows prediction across these different scales. Yeah, and in, in general, one of these inputs, either a sensory input or a grid cell input, is going to activate a lot of cells. Sensory input activates these columns, grid cells would activate rows. But when you take a bunch of modules together, uh, they can sparsify. Okay. All right. So, learned. yeah. All right. So, so okay. So I'm, that was really helpful what you just said a moment ago. So, I'm going to now paraphrase this from, again from my thinking here. It helps me. I don't want to dominate the conversation, but it, it helps guys through these things. Um, we relied on multiple grid cell modules to achieve sort of a unique representation of an object space or an object. And we didn't want to go to different scales because we didn't see how it worked. So we, we hoped that there'd be multiple modules of a similar scale, orientation, slightly different scale, but so on. Here, they're basically going to rely on multiple modules again. Um, but they're gonna rely on multiple modules across scale, which we've already identified, we think is a problem. With, we don't understand how it can work yet. Maybe it could, but at the moment we don't understand how it could work. Um, and, uh, but, but that's okay. But, and, and they're voting not at the grid cell level, but at the, 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 the modules that we're, we're, we're forming, we're looking across are more, more like place cell modules. And so uh, in that regard, an individual place cell in any one of these not modules is not unique to that object, which you know is, is true anyway. Um, but across modules, it, um, if you looked at the population across modules, then it would be a perhaps unique. Um, um, yeah, but I think the scale issue, the change of scale across the module, I'm just it's, it's a thing through my head right now, it's still a really big problem. I don't, I don't see how you get around that. Um, but, but, but I think the idea that thinking about grid cell modules I mean, place cell modules, um, either voting or place cell modules uh, um, combining together um, for uniqueness is, is an interesting idea that I don't think we've talked about a lot at all. Yeah, and, and I should then shout out to them that they part of you know what took them a lot of time on this paper is they went and then searched neural data from two experiments. Uh, they made the prediction that they would find that grid cells are correlated with specific place cells across multiple environments. And they got a decent result, say, like a, a nice little correlation there. It's not, it's not for sure, but it's there. 
uh, there, there yeah. seems to be a correlation between grid cells and place cells and cross, cross that, environments. That's interesting. Um, Hello, everyone. Oh, I was Florian meant to here. say hi. Hi, Florian. Have you been listening? I'm not sure if I can solve all of your confusion. I actually don't have that much time, but I definitely meant to stop by, given that I um, you know, pushed you guys to review uh, the Tom and Eichenbaum machine. Did you just join us, Florian, or were you here listening to all this conversation? I, I was listening to like the last three minutes or something. Uh -huh. Well, I have one, one slide less where, left where I'm just elaborating the, this point or putting a little words on what I just said. Uh, so uh, with multiple modules, the place cells can represent novel feature location pairs, uh, which is slightly different from what we just were talking about. I mean, it's not, it doesn't contradict it, but I'm not saying exactly what we just said. It's interesting that this system can represent novel feature location pairs um, without, it, it, it's, the, it's, the, it's the same grid cell trick as we've always talked about with multiple modules. You can represent multiple things. Well, you can represent novel things, um, but now it's at the place cell level. Uh, and so, so that's, just an, that, um, that's just a nice idea. And in, in our model, uh, I'll read the final bullet point. We can only represent a new feature location pair by forming new grid cell to place cell connections. Uh, whereas theirs, they can represent any pair they want and they don't have to learn it right away. They can trust that in the future, if this feature location pair occurs, the same, rep, the same set of cells is going to activate. Uh, they don't have to do any initial learning, whereas our temporal memory kind of does because it gen generates these random patterns. Uh, and it will only ever recover those random patterns if it, if it forms synapses to, to resurrect them. So there's a, there's a nice idea there. That's the other side of the coin that, of what I was saying in the previous slide. I still don't quite get this last bullet. Um, I still don't really understand how um, end to end, how path integration works in that, in that case. We, we, we bounced around it a bit. But if you're not forming new connections, then, and, and you said they have empirical evidence for this that the same grid cells part of the same place cells. So maybe, this, maybe that's what it is. Um, but it does seem to me to make it hard to imagine how path integration occurs in that case, because um, if the place cells are determined by sensory input, then, um, uh, then the grid cells are gonna be determined by sensory input and therefore you do not, you're not able to uh, use them as a metric space. Um, and path integrated. So we, we've talked about that a bit already, but I still don't see how it's going to work. Hmm. And if, by the way, it reminds you a little bit what you've been proposing, Marcus, recently, which is that you're sort of in between. Like you're saying like, hey, path integration works locally in an environment. <laughs> um, but as I move further in away in that environment, the path integration, you know, the, the, the grid cells sort of to store it and move around, and not in a sort of, um, they don't change rapidly, but they kind of get distorted to fit the new space and distorted to fit the new space, which is, which is somewhere in between. You're saying it's path integration up to a point, um, but it's, uh, but after a point, it, it gets distorted. So that, that's how I interpret that. You're in between those two extremes. Right, I, let's see, the, the connection I can draw between what they're saying and what I'm saying here, this, this middle bullet point, they have their place cells being deterministically determined by, <laughs> it's a, anyway, turn of phrase, uh, it, de determined by um, the grid cells and the sensory cells. Whereas what I've been saying is um, grid cells are determined, deterministically determined by the sensory input. Uh, it has been what I've been saying. So that's one connection between these where we're using similar words, but talking about different things. Their work does not require any kind of distortions, or they, they wouldn't predict any kind of distortions in this. They're, they're, the, the two populations are, are totally independent. Like this, this can path integrate whatever it wants. And the fact that the place cells can be computed from the input and the grid cells doesn't really influence the metricness of it. I guess I just don't understand that. I'm sorry, I'm missing it. Um. Yeah, I mean, the, the interesting thing from the experimental side is uh, like on this uh, relationship between grid cells and place cells and how dynamic uh, that is, that place cells may align with uh, like a specific grid cell set 
in one environment, but not the other. So there is like remapping does exist. Yet on the other hand, the relationships wait, 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 that do get formed are seemingly stable. But Floyd, what does that mean? If, it, if, it, if they're not stable in cross environments, then what does it mean? <laughs> I mean, it's not- That means it that... remaps like play cells do. Um, uh, yeah, but, 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 then, but then we can't say there's this one-to-one -one mapping, right? It's, it's I mean, this, the, the argument here is that there's this sort of pre-wired deterministic mapping Mm -hmm. And it's not learned. Um, and that then leads, in my mind, to problems. But then if we say, oh, well, it's, it's, got, it's got this permanent mapping, but we can just remap it when we need to uh, for another environment. Well, well then it's not entirely. Like so I, the way that uh, people think about this, I remember a conversation I had at Cosine last year. Um, kind of interesting that this is like almost exact one year ago since we're about to enter the next Cosine 2021 now. Um, was that how did he put it he said that like that these weak correlations he called them between grid cells and play cells may underlie sort of a hidden attractor landscape so you're not entirely free to put these wherever you want and that's what um what's his name kentros also has shown i think i like briefly talked about uh, cliff kentros um talked to, to about his, his work he's been like trying to like destabilize these grid cell play cell maps and uh, analyze how one re recovers the others or or doesn't and so it's a it's messy for us modelers but it's a mixed picture because on the one hand um we we like sort of like the the stable phase relationship between grid cells for example and that there is a link between grid cells and play cells that seems to be reliable yet on the other hand, when you destabilize them, there are multiple different places in which it, like, they might rematerialize, so to speak. So, um, so you're not free. It, it, these mappings are not entirely free. Uh, they're constrained somehow. But on the other hand, they tend to be stable a lot in the same environment. So mm. it's a mixed picture, which doesn't really help us modelers because we'd much rather have it be one or the other. Can I, can I just, I want to make sure I understood what you said for him. Because, mm -hmm. uh, so let me rephrase it and you tell me if I got it right. In my model right now, I say, oh, an animal's running out of the, in an environment and it gets to a certain corner of the room, a certain place they'll fire. Now, if in the middle of the room, there was, a, there was a, some obstacles that looked like the corner, kind of very similar to the corner, but just, it's not in the corner, it's in the middle of the room. It's like, Two walls coming together in the middle of them. Well, yeah. that same play cell may fire at that corner in that in the middle of the room when I approach that 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 interior feature that looks kind of like the the one in the corner of the room. Environmental cube binding. Yeah, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but what you're saying, I want to make sure what you I think you just said is that binding between oh, this is kind of a corner that looks like this, and therefore my play cell should fire. That mapping would be different in a different environment. Is that what you're saying? Like if I had another environment. That I perceived as different, and I ran into that similar corner in the middle. Yeah. That a different place cell would fire. Yeah. Then it saying? might it might be different, or it might be the same. Okay. And yet, All right. Well, and that's it's means it's, so it's yeah. not exactly chance. It's really not. Um, yeah, but within, within the particular environment, anytime I run across a corner-like thing like that, that same place goes to fire. But in a different environment, it might not. Well, there's and also no. I'm not sure if there's a guarantee for that. Like we know, for example, that in very big environments, even play cells repeat. Yeah, like no, the, I, I, right. That's like what I'm Gary saying. And, Caswell's work, who's actually also on the Tolman Eichenbaum machine paper. Um, you're saying they repeat even without the similar sensory input. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But we do know they repeat, and even in a small environment, we know they repeat if there's a similar sensory. Uh, environment in the middle. Yeah, it makes it more likely. Yes. Yeah. So that's the term right, is so, more likely. It's not deterministic. Uh, yeah, but, but I guess the, <laughs> but the, the point is that when I go in a different environment, I'm just I'm just trying to reiterate what you're saying. I'm not making a point. I'm just trying to try to yeah. understand the point. That in a different room, that, that that pairing wouldn't necessarily be more likely. It would be like, hey, I might have, I might find the same corner looking thing resulting in a completely different. Um, play cell, which, which if that were the case, and it tells me that the play cell is purely not being driven purely by the sensory input. The play cell is already taking advantage of the fact that there's a, uh, it knows what environment I'm in. So it's, it's like saying, yeah, this is, this is an A corner and I'm in room B, therefore every time I see an A corner in room B, I should become active 
But if I'm in, if I'm in a different room, well, who knows? What to do. Something else might happen. Right. I, I'm saying all that to say, yeah, did I get that right? <laughs> yeah, I mean that that's a way to put it. I don't want to hijack the discussion. Uh, you know, that Marcus no, was I, I'm giving, hijack, I'm hijack. just trying to you know help productively <laughs> with some of the caveats that I know about. No, I'm hijacking. I'm, I'm the one who's asking all the questions. Um, sorry, but it's important to me. Um, okay, well that's very very useful now. I didn't, know, I didn't understand that. I, I might want to like briefly point out that uh, I hope to build like a spiking uh, implementation of the Tomon Eichenbaum machine as part of uh, like an upcoming research project uh, with a computational neuroscience group. Um, and so as part of that, I want to like fully understand the, the implementation that they published. And so I'm taking it apart with uh, three colleagues of mine. Uh, so we're actually going through the methods in uh, in you know really small detail. I actually want to run the original code if I can. Um, so you know if if you're particularly curious about that, obviously you could join that group effort. Um, we're just starting now with a couple of meetings in the coming weeks. Yeah, it, I looked at their code a, a fair amount, and um, and so it's nice that they have, they have both TensorFlow and PyTorch versions available. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. Is solid. That's, so I that's do recommend the code. Uh, the re I do recommend the code as a complement to the to the uh, methods. Right. Right. Uh, anything else? I mean, if you've already looked at it in in, in that so detail, you already, yeah. did you in have any for, <laughs> we've gone through all my discussion points. So that's where so we are. So Florian, did, do you have any thoughts on this issue of the different scales of the modules? You know, we were talking about how um, that doesn't seem to work. In our thinking, that we the fact that it. they go across scales. Yeah, oh. because if yeah, because if you're trying to do some sort of um, stable attraction network, some of those modules will be changing rapidly. Some won't um, because they're running at different scales. And and it's hard for me to imagine what it means to have an attraction network when some parts are not, or some parts are are moving and other parts are not moving. Some parts are changing and other parts are not changing. And and so we've always avoided trying to vote across scales. So that it, or look at modules across scales because because of that issue. So the question is, we didn't get a, a resolution on that here. How they're handling that in this model? Um, why does it work? Um, yeah, you know, I can't. I, I don't think I have an answer to that. I might though in like two weeks or so. <laughs> you know, one, one way, you know, one way it might they might got around it. If you don't consider the system being dynamic, if you're just saying let's take a snapshot in time, then it works. Right, you can say take a snapshot on time, um, and in some sense, uh, that's how people thought about the multiple grid cell module at different scales. Which you, all right, at a snapshot in time, you have a unique representation. Mm. But if you if you flow if you watch the flow of patterns through time, then you have this these varying scales of change, and then then the attraction doesn't work anymore. So if you just I mean, if you're just looking at it as a static image, yeah, it works. Just to make a, like a neuroanatomical point about the combination of scales, I mean, obviously, it's an interesting question to ask about the, you know, the inputs to what extent they are uh, like actually combined. But if you look at like these cross sections through medial anterior rhinal cortex, you will find that along the dorsal ventral uh, gradient, there are numbers of different uh, grid cell layer scales that stack. Um, and the, the more you go to the, the ventral side, the, the more larger grids you have in there and they go to like deeper and deeper parts of it. So that at the, at the dorsal side, you only have, you know, one scale or two scales. And at the ventral side, you might have like five, six overlapping uh, oh, I scales. See. So you're saying that the scales are not segregated very well. I've always, I've always heard that they're pretty well segregated. Um, yeah, you can segregate them, but the thing is, it's like, um, hold on. Let me, I'm just going to quickly draw this on a piece of paper. Um, but if, they're, if they're sliding into each other and now fall by the Yeah, exactly. So it so kind of looks a little bit like this, uh, where on the one end, you yeah. only have like one grid cell module. Yeah. And then if you go a little bit further down the gradient, you're going to have like two that are stacked on top of each other. And then if you go even further, you might have four or five uh, different scales of, of grid cells, like layered on top of each other. Yeah. Um, 
And people are well, debating, you know, whether it's seven or eight different scales and, so and that's, like what the exact yeah, number is. But yeah. the, the point is anatomically, there's a gradient to how many scales are used. And they are such that the finer gradients exist kind of by themselves. And then you add on more and more in the deeper layers, like the larger scale ones, mm. which are then layered with the other ones. I mean, that, that an, it's anatomy you just showed, which I've seen mm. before, is, is suggestive. That, that that you might be combining those different models, but it's not it's not proof of it. It's no, uh, no, of course not. No, no, not. And, yeah. and again, well, I'm you, not proof, claiming proof that would, these connections no, no, exist. No, no, I know you're not claiming anything. Scales. I just, I just, I'm not, I'm not trying to trip you up. I just want to be, be mm. precise about this, because um, yeah. I think we've also read that the evidence that that cells actually collect information across those different scales is is not there, or they haven't found it yet, or it's marginal. Mm. Uh, so anatomically, they're stacked like that. But if, if, if an individual cell doesn't make that connection, then, um, then maybe it doesn't happen. Um, anyway, I think it's just still a very interesting problem, um, and it gets it's it's just one of the dimensions of this. I think we're all everyone this paper reviewing my work and Marcus's work and maybe your work. We're all there's a couple of key issues here. We're all trying to resolve. Mm. Um, we may think about the problems differently, but. But there's, there's several key things. How do you get uniqueness? How does how does sensory relate to spatial representation? Like you know, what is the uniqueness of the space code, the place cells versus the grid code, mm -hmm. and so on? You know, I think we're moving. Mark has been really arguing moving away from having these purely metric spaces. This paper we're reviewing today seems to me metric spaces are going to be really wonky. <laughs> I might be wrong. Yeah, but the think. more important thing is that it re-strengthens Numenta's um, sort of, you know, like statement that you can do this relational learning and that since it holds true for, for all the different nodes, that you can like do much faster inference, which yeah, was the yeah. point that the cortical learning framework also makes. I thought it was like, again, like too bad they didn't cite you guys. Um, but on the other hand, you know, maybe Tolman and Eichenbaum like deserved a shout out. It's uh, least controversial to name, uh, you know, yeah, a, a I, learning I, structure I when the I people are already dead. Them, I don't think we expect them to name anything after us, but a citation would have been nice. Yeah, know? exactly. That's you what know? I Because, hey, as Marcus pointed out, we got very similar diagrams, you know. And, yeah, exactly. And you did the exact same, like, exact same idea, right? To, yeah, yeah. to do these two, like this faster inference by learning through the structural generalizations yeah. that you can make yeah. and like do yeah. both. Yeah at the same time and then use conjunctive cells, right? I mean, link them yeah. together. That, that yeah. I, That's the core of idea and lots of people have been talking about it. I, I assume we're, um, we're probably running out of time here, but I, I just think we are running out of time because we have a limit. Oh, no, it's, uh, yeah, we do have anything. I just want to point out, well, I don't know if you've been paying any attention, but recently I've been, recently I've been talking about, really inspired by this, the papers you reviewed when you're here about the, the, you know, to generate a grid cell, you need a bunch of one dimensional movement vector things <laughs> and exactly. you know and so there was the, the whole con there was the concept of the um uh, the, the oscillating dendrites or right. there could be a set of cells that each or each running at theta plus some vco uh, the whole delta oscillatory delta. interference so i've yeah. really been working on that idea right and, and mm -hmm. we have multiple cells in the mini column that are all oscillating at the same um frequency but but offset by their phase and so mm -hmm. now, if you, if you think of that as like a 1D grid cell module, uh, and any individual column has lots of those, then yeah. you have a unique code right within the column. Uh, it's, yeah. it's got some other issues, but- so I think I, the, the last word on like these oscillatory interference models has not been spoken yet. I mean, they are like aging, but the thing is when I talked to Neil Burgess at Cosine, he pointed out to me that, well, yeah, he still thinks there's something to this and somebody should analyze this and like, you know, do their actual experiments on it. But he was like, you know, trying to keep it down a little bit because he was like building the lab equipment for that, and that, that takes time. But what to get the whole oscillatory interference idea? I mean, to me, that's almost like settled. You're saying it's not settled? N no, it's not settled. I mean, the, in the modeling literature, there's still people, you know, doing all, um, you know, I mean, the, the nobody is contesting the like the inhibitory surround idea of the CAN models, uh, yeah. the, which work really great, like for stability, and they're awesome for lots of different things. But, uh, but of course, this is about the update mechanism, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. So the, the, the hybrid sense. model, which you which you also yeah. presented a paper on that, exactly. That seems to me, and so that seems like that seems like the answer. But 
the, the idea yeah. of the oscillatory interference, I don't know if there's any other proposals really to, to get the phase procession as we see it. No, none that I know. So that pretty uh, that's, much that's the thing the that everybody that is ignoring, right? Well, that nails the answer there. It's got to, there has to be oscillatory interference. Unless, yeah, unless but there's lots of great things you can do on the machine learning side without addressing that, right? Like this, this, oh, course, this architecture, but... the Tomon Eichenbaum machine is a, is a great machine learning um, sort of like advance. Uh, at least it can be used for, for uh, all learning tasks that have, you know, structure to them. Right. Yeah. Uh, whether that's well, spatial I'm, or not. But I'm talking about the, the neurobiology or so and the neurobiology. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Of course. No, no, that's, uh, it, it's hard to investigate because of course, particularly the, the, the claims that you somehow do actual interference at the neuron is, um, it's hard to verify because you need intracellular recordings at multiple, oh, okay. uh, multiple dendrites. Yeah. And so it's like really hard to like engineer that like patch clamp wise. So I, I, can you do that with some kind of, you know, yeah. uh, calcium imaging that is so precise. We don't, we don't have to, to worry that. about that. We don't have to worry about that too much. We can do No, but, but Neil Burgess needs to worry about yeah, that I because he that. needs yeah, to right. defend this if he's going to push this further. I, I got it. All right. So from our point of view, the fact that they can't measure it right now, it's, it's, it's unfortunate, but it's not a, it's not a roadblock for us. Right. <laughs> we, we keep going forward and deduce what's going on. Um, yeah, of course. Yeah, all right. Uh, very interesting. But I'm glad you joined us today, Paul. You know, it's very helpful. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit sad I couldn't like dial in earlier, but uh, I'm um, also just meant to say I'm just happy to see you guys. Yeah, um, <laughs> so, it's great to um, see you too, Florian. <laughs> I know, I 